Geospatial industry today craves the infusion of youth into its ranks. The young professionals that represent millennial and Generation Z voices. The bright young minds that help reimagine geospatial in a complex digital environment. Young leaders that represent our industry's future. Our geospatial World 50 Rising Stars are the personality that have achieved an outstanding accomplishment as young individuals who are proactive and passionate about the value of geospatial technology to the society, the environment and the economy. Let's meet the young professionals of the geospatial world 50 rising stars selected from high quality nominations across global community who stand out at the top of their class and are well on their way to redefining the next generation geospatial leadership. It's a process which was initiated by Geospatial World about two years before. And that was an outcome of uh, various suggestions which we received from various sections of the community. And then we went through the process of a very detailed process of uh, developing a campaign encouraging people to nominate, self-nominate, as well as nominated by their organizations. And I must say that over a period of two years, several institutions have actually gone very, very proactively to nominate their rising stars in this program. We have a great jury for that, led by John Kedar, who is a very accomplished person. And, uh, we all have seen him many times. John led this jury process for two years, and he is the one who has been building this uh, concept of Rising Stars uh, with our team. So today we are going to hear some of them who are the part of the Rising Stars of this year. And trust me that there are just very few of them, but each one of those 50 Rising Stars have made huge difference and huge contributions in their organizations, in the professions they are, and around their own community. And they encourage, they encourage a lot of other youngsters to actually pursue this profession. They encourage a lot of uh, you know, uh, their ecosystem to get more attracted to the profession of geospatial uh, uh, you know, industry. With this, I would like to uh, A, congratulate all of you, first of all, uh, for being a rising star. And uh, one of those rising stars is my own colleague, uh, Ananya. Uh, and uh, you know, the, some of the facts and figures and the economic impact assessment studies and reports which you have seen in this morning or across the, uh, you know, the galleries, the posters, all that has been led by Ananya. She's an economist by education and geospatial by, I think, her pursuit of evangelism or maybe pursuing some kind of unique which is more connected with the society. So rising star Ananya, please take over the stage and move forward. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, first of all, a very warm welcome to all of you for a very interesting panel. I don't think I could have been more honored to host a panel with the rising stars of today and the future of geospatial industry tomorrow. Um, I have an amazing set of panelists. Uh, I think uh, in the last, last panel, Ingrid rightly mentioned that we need to focus more on young professionals. How young can we get, <laughs> right? Um, so I will not waste much time. I'll introduce you to my panelists today. I have Iris Kramer, founder and CEO, Arc AI. I have Brilla Campos, census analyst, Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics. I have Pooja Mahapatra, solution owner, Geospatial Fugro. And I have Meena Esam, GIS developer, IT Smart Vision. So to, just to start this panel, I would request Iris to first give us a brief introduction of herself and also tell us what interests her in geospatial. All right, yeah. So 
Um, my name is Iris Kramer, and I'm the founder and CEO of RKI. Um, and when I started, my career was in archaeology. Um, and uh, during that study, it's very much like a, a humanity studies, but actually I was really interested in the geospatial side. So like on a really big la landscape scale, where did humans live? What places did they choose to live? And um, am I also speaking about my five minutes? Is this the five minutes? Yes. OK, <laughs> brilliant. <laughs> OK, so yeah, you can see on the screen a bit of my background from archaeology, then into doing specifically a master's in GIS within archaeology to study the landscape uh, patterns of humans. And I was really interested in actually the rise of AI, self-driving cars. And I thought, wow, maybe I can, I can automate the, the discovery of archaeological sites with uh, Earth observation data, LIDAR, satellite imagery. And so um, I learned how to code in a three-month boot camp and then was looking for funding to fund a PhD to do specifically this. And I was really fortunate to find funding from the Ordnance Survey um, and did a PhD in computer science at University of Southampton. During that process, um, we saw that there was um, uh, a lot of... Um, uh, it, it worked so well, so I could scale, I thought I could scale that up to a national level, um, maybe even international, like there was so much potential for the technology that I was developing. And so I founded RKI towards the end of the PhD, I got funding from various uh, grant bodies like Geovation from the Ordnance Survey, uh, Royal Academy of Engineering, and um, we now have, after two years, customers including the Forestry Commission and um, the National Trust. And most recently, <laughs> recently last week, I was named uh, one of Forbes 30 under 30, so that was a big personal achievement. Um, so roughly like what do we do? We use LiDAR data and we visualize it really for an archaeological purpose because what we're looking at is small elevation differences, earthworks um, like these roundhouses which are prehistoric uh, dry stone walls that have been overgrown. As you can see as this picture from the Isle of Arran, it's so overgrown that you can't actually really often find them when you're standing on the ground. But LiDAR allows us to remove the vegetation and really uh, appreciate fully what is underneath. And so we have been then using AI, so we are using known archaeological site locations of these roundhouses to train the AI to find internally features like circles um, to, to find these roundhouses. Um, and we've been able, in my PhD, I used an object detection approach, which you can see on the, on the bottom center image. And then during the company, we've now got a segmentation approach where we can look at images of lots of different sizes and shapes, um, and we're able to do that really well. Um, and what you can see then um, is uh, that even with field work, we can then further verify and really go to those locations that maybe previously we couldn't see and then really appreciate them, remove some of the vegetation and, and, and yeah, discover new archaeological sites. We found over 100 in the, the PhD research. So, so far then I've worked with the Forestry Commission to look at um, detecting ridge and furrow, which is an approach to medieval plowing. And you can see that on the image uh, on, the, on the left, where we can see in the landscape what that looks like today uh, as a result of continuous plowing over decades, uh, hundreds of years. And um, I can take you with this video through the landscape of Northumberland in, the, in England. Um, and we are looking at how high is that preservation, how tall are these ridge and furrow earthwork remains, so that we can see um, which locations sh should be protected and not planted with new trees. So that's, that's a legal requirement. So we are helping organizations like the Forestry Commission to, um, to interpret the, the results of, of, of uh, a LIDAR survey. And then another project that we've been able to do with the uh, National Trust is actually something completely different. We haven't used Earth observation data for this. We used historic mapping, um, and we've been able to detect orchards. Uh, the symbols of orchards and the gridded pattern of orchards is very un like specific. Um, and so we've been able to train the AI on these on a national scale, something that has actually been done manually for the last six years, and they've only come so far as, as, as a third of the country with, with a large group of volunteers. Now we've been able to map on a national scale where the orchards used to be, and we can compare them to the modern day locations of orchards. And that is just really exciting, never done before, um, and we've um, 
we want to do that on, on lots of different woodlands of diversities that we can decide and find out where we should replant uh, trees in, in the efforts uh, of uh, biodiversity and, um, uh, and all that. So yeah, um, that's my introduction to what we do. Thank you so much, Iris, and many congratulations on 34 30. I think that's a great achievement. Uh, now uh, we have Brella, who would introduce us. Okay. Yes? Yes. Uh, so uh, my name is pronounced Brella <laughs> in Portuguese. So it's really difficult also for Brazilians to say my name. So it's OK. Uh, and I'm geography, and I have a PhD in oceanography. So in both areas, I always use very special technologies to uh, understand the behavior of the environment and also my work in Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics with a lot of very special techniques. So uh, my uh, introduction will be more philosophical <laughs> about my experience, uh, about the things I believe that are essential uh, to rethink beyond the obvious, uh, which I uh, think are three points, uh, knowledge, qualification, and a collaborative work. So we can think what's uh, most urgent to know and how is a given phenomenon specialized. Uh, and we can think of monitor environmental, social, and economic phenomena, uh, take into, into consideration the different special and temporal scales to which they are subject. Uh, and this way, uh, we will have the necessary information to think about the possible impacts and consequences consequence that a uh, given ter territory will be subject to under uh, adverse conditions, for example, as we have the climate change affecting our lives. Uh, and mm, let's see. Yeah. Uh, continuing in, in this direction, uh, we can think what information for the territory is relevant to be mapped. And moreover, what's important is to map when one wants to count the population. Here I am talking about my, my work nowadays. Uh, so in this sense, it's important to think about uh, how to speed up the mapping process so that we can account for geoinformation information on a national scale. And it's necessary uh, to evaluate the best way to help different centers uh, spread out uh, spread around the country, uh, so it's the case of Brazil that we have a lot of uh, units uh, to help mapping the, the whole ter territory of Brazil. So we can produce maps of uh, our country uh, in a standardized way, and we can be, and, and that can be used in the different surveys for the institution and also for other uh, players uh, that want this, this data. So another point that I think is important, oh, yeah, no, <laughs> is about qualification and, and expertise. So uh, in countries like Brazil, uh, the access to quality education is not a reality for everyone. And to incentive to study the basis for a good qualification, uh, it should take place in basic education. I think it's a, a primordial. So uh, we can face several problems, such in, in my uh, reality in Brazil. In the basic education, we have problems with lack of structure, women resources, engagement of managers to promote a quality education that can instigate the youngest to question uh, themselves about the reality that surrounds them, uh, which emphasizes on the where. That's why we're here. Uh, in, in addition, um, we're encouraging uh, girls from early age and also even f during graduation to take chance on geotechnology work, which is super important. And uh, I'm talking about my experience as a woman in geotechnology work. So in the future, we will have a more heterogeneous dialogue space with different visions. And finally, uh, training professionals to face real challenges is essential. Uh, and to all of this, uh, working in a collaborative effort is really important and to have the best approach to understand, understand the space we live and to see better possibilities uh, to solve your special problems, such uh, as uh, teams with uh, collaborators with different backgrounds, uh, treating the problem in an interdisciplinary way, and exchange ideas. That's why we can uh, go forward. 
And to close my speech, uh, there's no time here. Maybe I'm on time? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not saying this. Okay. Uh, no, no. Yes. So to close my speech, I bring a quote uh, from Ezri Chief Scientist down, brown, da down right, uh, which captures my thoughts pretty well. That uh, the more diversity you have in the data and also in types of people work on a problem, then the better probability of getting closer to an answer. So with this, I uh, say, oh, no, no. Let's see. Now I can say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Obrigada. <laughs> thank you so much, Vera. Um, I hope I pronounced your name, name right this time. Uh, Braila. Braila. It's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> uh, Pooja, what interests you in geospatial? What brings you here? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ananya. I, I have no doubt that you can pronounce my name correctly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, indeed, I, 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 I grew up in India. Um, I'm actually an electrical engineer by background. Um, um, what was the pinnacle of, of electrical engineering in terms of building difficult circuitry? That was, for me, building satellites. So that was, for me, what I wanted to do in my life. Uh, first of all, I wanted to be an astronaut. That didn't really work out. So uh, I thought, well, let's start making satellites. So I came to Europe for my master's, <coughs> um, for, for a, a, indeed a master's program in Sweden and in Germany um, about building satellites. Fascinating program. Um, uh, had a wonderful two years. But then that got me thinking, we spend all this money building these satellites. How can we extract maximum value from the data that comes out of these satellites for, you know, for the good of the world? Um, so, so that sort of intrigued me more and more. Um, and then that led me to, uh, to also go down the, the, uh, the, the research route. I, I did a PhD on the topic of, of INSAR. For people uh, in the room who know anything about INSAR, it's about measuring millimeter deformations of the Earth from space using radar satellites. Um, and and my, my specific work was about connecting that with other kinds of measurement techniques like tide gauges and, and sort of connecting land subsidence with uh, sea level rise to be able to do comparative uh, studies. So that, that got me, of course, very much interested in, in the whole Earth observation space. Um, I worked at, a, at, a, at Skygeo, uh, which was then a startup company for, for a couple of years. Um, and then I wanted to go a little bit broader than INSAR. I wanted to look at, at what, what else can Earth observation do? Uh, what, what other geospatial data is out there? Um, so from, um, I decided to work from a very small startup company all the way to one of the biggest companies there are. <laughs> I worked at Shell then for about three and a half years. Um, I was within their, their geospatial team, really embedded within, uh, within making geospatial happen within, within Shell. So I was part of many of their digital transformation programs. Um, I worked uh, specifically on the topic of looking outside in the market for uh, geospatial technologies that were utilized in other domains, trying to bring that into Shell, deploy that within Shell assets, and actually bring value from, um, um, from, from these technologies. So I, I had the honor of presenting my work to, to the CEO, and, and, and it was, it was a, a, great, a great program in, in the company. Um, and then I realized my passion is really about using geospatial data for the good of, 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 of humankind. Um, and at, at some point, a few group came along my way, uh, uh, another big Dutch company, uh, now uh, definitely an inter international company headquartered in the, in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, I was blown away by the breadth of geospatial technologies that Fugro could do. Um, in, in fact, in the last couple of days, I've, I've had people asking me, well, what does Fugro do? I think it's easier for me to answer what does Fugro not do in the geospatial domain. From uh, gathering data in the, in, 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 uh, you know, um, to look for the MH370 uh, plane that, that uh, ended up somewhere in the middle of the, of, the, of the ocean, all the way to topographic mapping, to earth observation, to, I mean, pretty much the whole spectrum is, is, is what Fugro is, is busy with. And my role within Fugro now is, is, as a solution owner for Geospatial, is to really connect all our internal innovations to build compelling solutions for our clients, to make sure that we're not offering them uh, a range of things to choose from, but really listening to our clients, understanding what they actually need, and offering to them the most fit-for-purpose solution for their problems. Um, and this spreads around the, the three main pillars of uh, basically climate change related, um, energy transition, and uh, resilient infrastructure. 
And I specifically focus on resilient infrastructure because I think for me that's the topic closest to my heart. So the, the effect of climate change on infrastructure and how geospatial can help in that domain. Um, so, for example, uh, talking about coastal resilience, talking about infrastructure in the Arctic. Um, I mean, pretty much over all of these different regions, uh, we, we as Fugro, we, uh, we, we offer our services. Um, yeah, and why that's personally interesting to me, um, I was actually thinking about this uh, uh, in the, over the weekend. I was thinking about the GWF and I was thinking about all the sessions and what I would speak. Um, I, it was a beautiful sunny day, really, and uh, I, was, I was watching my kids play. I, I have two girls, uh, four and one. They were happily playing in our little garden, and I was thinking, what is the world actually going to look like for them, you know, in 20, 30, 40 years' time, when they're in, you know, in, their, in their prime of their youth, if I want to call it that? Uh, what's the world going to look like? Are they going to be walking around in Wellingtons because there's going to be, you know, water everywhere, uh, especially in the Netherlands? I would not <laughs> say that's very far-fetched. Um, or, you know, especially here in the West, uh, and I think we've discussed this in several of these sessions uh, over the last couple of days, it, it's really hard to find people to do work on the ground. Like, if, if you want to send somebody to go inspect a bridge, you're not going to be able to find, easily find these people uh, in, in the West or in the OECD countries anyway. Um, and and that, that really drives home the reason why it's important to have a good digital twin, a good geospatial-based digital twin, so that people can actually do their decision-making from behind their desks in, in the, in the most, most effective way. Um, so that's if, if they decide to live here. But maybe they want to move to a different country, maybe to a, to, to a country where uh, there are more pressing concerns r related to lifetime of infrastructure, you know, infra infrastructure that's been neglected for, uh, for maybe a few years. Um, so I grew up in India, like I said, and at least back then, um, you could see that the, the effect of neglected infrastructure is, is something that affects daily life in, in a very tangible way. And I know it's changed a lot. Every time I go back, I'm amazed at how much, uh, how much development and how much renewal of infrastructure is happening. And, and I would like us as the geospatial people to really be part of that. This is, this is not, uh, so resilient infrastructure around the world is not a problem that one company can solve. So um, I'm also very, uh, Fugro is a very active member of the World Geospatial Industry Council, the WGIC. Uh, there are lots of, uh, lots of other members obviously here in the audience as well. And I think together, collaboratively, we, uh, as the, the, the private sector in the geospatial domain, can definitely make a difference by forming the right partnerships and having those fit-for-purpose solutions that our clients can, um, can use. So, I don't know if that was five minutes, but either way, that was my story. <laughs> That's all right. That was really interesting to hear, hear your journey from being an electric engineer to geospatial. <laughs> so, Mina, we look forward to hearing from you. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, this is sort um, uh, my, beg my, beg uh, my background. Um, I am um, come from uh, Egypt. I work for uh, a National Statistical Office for uh, seven years. Uh, as a software developer, uh, and uh, finally I worked uh, in another in private sector, and uh, with uh, Sedej uh, uh, as a freelancer to develop some uh, geographic uh, tools and and so on. Uh, today I um, I will speak about uh, Sedej Kartu, the online uh, map catalog. Uh, uh, this is the unique one in Egypt. Uh, let's start with uh, who is Sedej. Sedej is a um, French uh, research cen uh, center in Egypt um, uh, for economic and social studies and uh, documentation. Uh, so, uh, why is this uh, map catalog, online map catalog, uh, is very important? Uh, because uh, let's start with uh, it's the unique uh, map uh, catalog in, in Egypt. Uh, and uh, it's uh, in interactive and uh, uh, and uh, easy tool to uh, for the researchers to find the, uh, the maps uh, and uh, it's a big step uh, in uh, to open data and uh, special field in, in Egypt uh, and uh, finally we, we can say about the the final uh, the, the size of uh, the backside uh, validation, the verification, the manipulation, uh, which done on this uh, data. Uh, about this library, uh, this library it's uh, multi uh, multi collection, a multi uh, scalar collection uh, of uh, topographic and 
and the geographic and the cadastral uh, maps. It, it contains more than 5,000 uh, maps and as a phase one. And the Sedej working uh, to, um, to, um, to, uh, to, to reach uh, 2,000 maps uh, at the end of the year. Uh, uh, this, this maps is, uh, these maps are grouped in, uh, in uh, multiple series or uh, matrices. Uh, uh, right now it contains more than 70 uh, series. Uh, the first one or the oldest one from uh, the end of the uh, 19th uh, century. Uh, and for sure, uh, they, uh, they in, in multiple on different uh, scales uh, started from uh, 1 to 500 till 1 to million. And uh, finally, uh, there, is, uh, or there are many uh, sources for this data, uh, like um, a defense, uh, defense mapping agency, uh, uh, Army Map Surface, National Statistical Office, and in uh, uh, and Corps of Engineers, if I remember, in cooperation with many external agents, uh, agencies uh, from outside of, of Egypt. Uh, today, uh, I will highlight um, uh, the most features for the researcher at, uh, at the front end. And uh, I think um, if I have some time, I, I will highlight so, uh, uh, the, the, the size of uh, data manipulation and verification which is done for uh, the backend, uh, the backend uh, for this data. Uh, about the front-end features uh, which developed uh, to easy find uh, these uh, maps for the researchers, uh, we, we developed three ways to find uh, the maps in an easy way, the advanced uh, search uh, by, uh, by loading the index uh, itself that contains the maps which collected in a specific uh, range of, of time, and uh, finally uh, by specific coordinates, so the, we, we used um, Egypt subdivision uh, 2016 uh, lookup. Uh, so if uh, any researcher uh, knows about these subdivisions, so he can navigate for a specific area and, and choose it and can uh, load uh, these maps easily. Uh, let's start with uh, the searching with, with uh, the location or by coordinates. Uh, we are using, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, the census uh, subdivisions uh, lookup um, 2017. Uh, so uh, the operator uh, or the researcher or anyone who interested to find uh, the maps easily, he can uh, um, uh, type any, any, any words from this uh, region and can uh, fly to, to it, then uh, just uh, click uh, on a, in any coordinate or any location and uh, we will show him all the maps in, in, this, in this area. Uh, and this map uh, will be projected uh, on the current uh, base map, and uh, also he, he, he can fly from, from map uh, to map, from scale to scale, and this map uh, will be uh, presented with uh, the suitable zoom, so he can see the differences over the time. Uh, and for sure can see uh, these maps uh, with, with the, right, uh, the right zoom. Uh, uh, let's say uh, quickly about uh, the, the advanced search. Uh, we offer many, many advanced tools uh, uh, to search for specific uh, zones, keywords, dates, uh, the collection dates, the scales, and so on. The final, the final, uh, the final uh, way and the most, the most important one, uh, the search by index, so the, the, uh, the, uh, the researcher can load the index, all the index, and they can uh, show the index in uh, just boundaries or the original images, so he can uh, see uh, the difference as we mentioned uh, over the time. Uh, if we see he uh, here a military uh, city uh, 25,000 uh, loaded as boundaries uh, and uh, also can load it as uh, images. Uh, for uh, and we build uh, one of the algorithms or technologies we used at the back end for the manipulation uh, and use at the front end. Uh, we we use some normalization for the Arabic uh, language and uh, as well as the English. So sometimes we we type the regions uh, as we pronounce. So we work to to find all areas uh, that match the keywords. Uh, so we can see. Uh, all the, the, the keyword match the, carry, uh, the Cairo as if the researcher uh, or anyone, uh, sorry, 
Can next slide? Uh, the next one, please. Uh, 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 see if, if you see here, uh, we, we can uh, uh, load multiple series, uh, so we can see uh, uh, wa uh, 500 series and uh, two, uh, two, uh, 2050 uh, uh, series uh, loaded, so we can see the intersection between the series over the time. Uh, and also, uh, if, if we uh, clicked on each map, uh, we, we, we provide this information about the map, uh, the map title as collected at this time, uh, the city which belonged, uh, belonged to it, the map uh, reference, the scale, the metadata, the, the coordinates, the shape, details, the cover zone, as we see in this uh, example. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mina. Uh, it was a lovely presentation. It was really interesting to see uh, the work, the kind of work that you're doing. Uh, unfortunately, we are very short of time. And I know we had discussed a lot of questions that we would have liked to take up, but we wouldn't be able to. However, I would still request everyone to please give, us, uh, give an applause to these young rising stars for trying to make a difference uh, in the geospatial frontier. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.